And yeah. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be back. I, I appreciate the invitation to share some of our work and, and um, to those of you listening now or watching later, um, we are there as a resource as, as Luna had mentioned and I um, would really welcome more engagement with folks in, in Tacoma, especially, um, but really anywhere throughout the West, Western Washington where we can reach would be um, super ideal and we're there as a resource. So I'm gonna start um, I'm going to walk you through some research we're doing on a, a disease that's emerging um, relatively recently or something that we're still learning very, very much about as we go. Um, there's not a lot known and it is kind of a new issue to us, although we think it's been in the area for a really long time and is just now emerging as a concern and I'll get into that. So I'm going to start by um, just introducing myself a little bit further from Luna's introduction and share a little bit about our program in Puyallup and, and introduce you to um, the other resources that you might be, be interested there. Then I'll talk about sooty bark disease in the Northwest and, and kind of how it has emerged recently. Um, we'll talk about the, the fungus that causes the disease. Um, and then I'll just really just show you a bunch of photos of, of trees that we're seeing, particularly around Tacoma and encourage you um, to engage with us around this and help us understand um, what's going on and, and how big of an issue this is. Um, and so I'll outline kind of how that works as, as community scientists um, and why, why it's important for you all to engage and we would love to have your engagement. So before I begin, I also want to acknowledge that um, I'm really privileged and, and honored to be presenting to, to you today from Tacoma, my home in Tacoma and the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. And I also learn and work and explore and study and research in this really cool research and extension center in, in um, the city of Puyallup. So also in the traditional homelands of Puyallup tribe of Indians. But we're also just generally, you know, have this great privilege to explore this beautiful lands um, the ancestral lands, the Coast Salish peoples, and, and I am just, I feel really lucky to be here and to be able to share our love and, and, and research on what's going on in this area. But, um, you know, I just, I would like to, you know, I'm hoping that this information will help us all become better land stewards or stewards of the land as the communities have done in this region since time immemorial. So as I mentioned, I'm, I, work at a WSU and Extension, WSU um, Research and Extension Center in Puyallup. Um, it's a really, the, the research station's only three years younger than the main campus in Pullman. So it's been around for a really long time. Um, and it's been really neat to see how it's adapting to our needs across the urban, increasingly urbanizing environment. But even though we're there in Puyallup, it's really a great opportunity and resource for us all in Tacoma. And I encourage you um, to reach out to me if you wanna do a little tour and see or learn more about the research that's going on there. As Luna mentioned, I'm here today because I'm also really privileged to have support from the USDA um, in the form of this. So it supports my time and effort um, putting together research and and, and sharing what we're learning and, and studying with you all today. In Puyallup at the Research Center, I'm part of a program called the Ornamental Plant Pathology Program. And we do a lot of different research on um, tree health issues in the region. We work with ornamental plant trade nurseries, um, plant producers, and, and those that trade and, and um, grow potted plants. And so that's kind of where our ornamental plant pathology comes from. Um, and we work with them to prevent spreading diseases or to reduce the impacts of diseases on their, on their industry and their nursery crops. Um, we also have some really cool um, research about Pacific madrones and we have common garden study where we have madrones collected from throughout its range and we're comparing different families to see how they perform in changing climates and under pressure from diseases like um, madrone leaf blight. And I encourage you to, to check that out more. Um, I'm just noticing that I don't have a slide. I usually have a slide about the Arbutus army um, to accompany this. And, and so if you love madrones, I really encourage you 
to join us um, to come and Tree Foundation's hosting a, a Madrone walk in December, which is also a part of this Arbutus Army, which is a community um, centered on Madrone. And so we like to share out kind of updated research about Madrone and engage people in projects around Madrone. And so that's arbutusarmy.org. And army is spelled A-R-M-E for Arbutus. It's the shorthand for Arbutus Nanzisii. And so um, I recommend you, if you love Madrone, you, you come and check that out. But we also do a lot of research with conifers. Um, our, our program does a lot of, kind of uses Christmas trees as model systems and, and has learned a lot about conifer diseases and insects through um, supporting the, the Christmas tree industry. But we work a lot with um, native trees, native species, um, you know, a lot of Christmas trees are noble fir, and that's native species that that is really important. But we work here. You can see some hemlock, some Douglas fir. We also have some um, red cedar, and we do work on like alder and some other local native species as well. Also, as Luna mentioned, I'm I'm leading this program called the Forest Health Watch, and I would love to to share more. I will share a little bit more about this, um, but there's lots of different ways to engage with us in this project and 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 we really welcome more partners in the development and um, kind of co-production of this project. So please, if you're interested in partnering in any capacity or learning more, please check out forcehealth.org. So within the Forest Health Watch, um, and as Luna mentioned, I've previously have, have, a pro, have been um, generously invited or graciously invited to, to share about this research on red cedar. This has really been our focus where we're interested in the dieback of red cedar and, and trying to understand what factors are affecting red cedar and what's driving this kind of top dieback that we're seeing throughout its native range. And through that, we, we use an iNaturalist project to document um, where, where healthy trees and unhealthy trees are. And through that effort, we're starting to get a good you know, amount of observations shared where we can use the GPS um, location and knowing whether that tree is healthy or not to really start to explore the, the important factors that might be involved. Like what are the weather patterns that are connected or associated with top dieback on red cedar? What, uh, you know, is there places in the landscape where they're more vulnerable to um, these other patterns. And of course, is there um, other factors like the soil type that might be predisposing or accelerating the dieback of red cedar? And so we're, we're, we're at this point now where we have um, a lot of observations and we can explore these kind of really cool, um, or we can really start to understand what's going on with red cedar because so many community scientists have, have helped kind of map where it's where they're seeing unhealthy trees and where they're seeing healthy trees. So this is about all I was going to take a minute to introduce ourselves and just let it let you know that we're, we're totally a resource to you all and I would really welcome more um, more invitations like this and more more opportunities to engage with communities in the Puget Sound region, especially. So please feel free to contact me if um, I can help with in any way or answer any questions or if, if there's an educational opportunity and you, you think tree health would be a, a good topic. So I'm going to switch now and talk get to the, the topic at hand, the sooty bark disease, and we're going to talk a little bit about this story. Um, sooty bark disease is caused by a fungus called Cryptostroma corticale. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but what's interesting about this fungus is that we we it was first observed and found in Pullman, Washington in 1968. And so we confirmed it's the same fungus with molecular techniques really recently. We were able to go back to this old herbarium specimen and, um, and extract the DNA and confirm it's the same fungus that we're, we're seeing emerge now. So we know this fungus has been in Washington state for um, a long time, but you know, understanding how it's spread within the state and things like that is, is where we, we need more information and we need more research. That herbarium also had a specimen submitted in, from Centralia in 2007, but at that time, um, 
or currently it's on loan to some researchers in Germany. So we weren't able to actually confirm it's the same thing, but um, it does seem like if it's the same fungus, it's been in Centralia at least for um, you know more than 10 years. So we need to we need to look at that a little closer. But this is just kind of how the story is unfolding in the Northwest. Then in 2020, Seattle started um, noticing it on a lot of unhealthy trees and a lot of the trees that they were um, removing because they're hazards or trees that had just died in public spaces. And so Seattle Parks had um, started to see this um, pattern in the trees and the symptoms of sooty bark disease and the trees that they were removing or, or um, maintaining um, throughout Seattle. And they first started sending samples to this lab called um, Bartlett Tree Lab, Bartlett Tree Experts. They have diagnostic lab. Um, and so Seattle had sent them a handful of samples and they, Bartlett um, did a really great job confirming whether or not that fungus was on those samples. And so they've kind of summarized their findings um, with sooty bark disease in this technical report that they produced. And we've linked that on our webpage, excuse me, they've on our webpage here, ppo.pl.wsu.edu slash SBD for sooty bark disease. So if you're interested in knowing kind of what, what was coming out of those early samples, what samples were submitted, um, what trees they found it on, that it's all summarized in this report and I'll summarize it a little bit in a second as well. Also um, in, in July, this, this previous July, um, there was also a, a news article from Seattle Times about the, the fungus and about this disease and the emergence of this disease. Um, it's a great article. They got some things, um, you know, not perfectly correct, like, like it's not a newly discovered fungus, it's a fungus that we've known or that science has known for a really long time, um, but it's, it's emerging in the Northwest more now, um, which we think is largely because um, trees are becoming more stressed from the longer and hotter droughts we're experiencing, but also it seems like the fungus is favored by warmer temperatures. And so the fungus is actually performing better um, as things also warm and dry out. But this article had a, a neat map kind of showing where um, samples have been confirmed by Seattle Parks and Recreation staff um, throughout Seattle. And so it, it's a, it's a um, article we're checking out. I do want to highlight this. Um, there's another newsletter piece um, written by the forest pathologist, one of the forest pathologists for the state, Rachel Brooks, and it's a, a, a really great piece. And this is in the um, DNR, Department of Natural Resources tree link newsletter. And so you can find it. Um, and Rachel is, is really emerging as the expert on this disease in the state. So I encourage you um, to, to follow their work and, and the state stuff. About this time, um, when Seattle is finding all these positive samples, um, they invited us to to visit and see what was going on. And after that, we, we submitted a proposal to the Forest Service as part of their emerging pest grant. And we were awarded um, a small grant to, to support diagnostic efforts. And so this allows us to cover the cost if a city wants to send samples and confirm um, if city bark disease is there. And, and Depending on how much um, samples we're getting, and how, how many um, folks are interested, we totally invite you to send us samples and we'll do our best to confirm whether or not this fungus is on those trees or not. Um, but it will also be helpful for, um, for our research to have more samples sent to us. And I'll talk about that a little more. Um, so, Within this story, we, we also, after um, getting this grant, we, we started looking around and we've confirmed that it's in Tacoma on a number of samples. And so this is why it's particularly relevant to the Tacoma Tree Foundation and our community here. And, um, and it is very interesting to, to, to think about as kind of an urban experiment. You know, We know it's here, um, what's it doing here? What trees are susceptible? And together we all can work together to really further our understanding so that 
we know what trees to plant in the future and what trees not to, or we know how to how to help our local trees like big leaf maple and native trees like uh, big leaf maple. Um, this is kind of a, a really ugly map that I threw together, um, but it just indicating like we've gotten samples from a lot of places. These orange ones are the ones that we've confirmed are the same fungus. And so um, there's some samples that come from Olympia. There's some samples that have come from um, Seattle, of course, and, and these are covered up. There's some in Tacoma and also Bellingham and Anacortes. So then um, the blue is just indicating that we are still processing those samples. So that's kind of the story that is emerging so far. At first, we didn't know if it was localized to Seattle. And then with more investigation, like going back to the herbarium specimen, um, the bigger picture is starting to unfold where, where it does seem like we're seeing it throughout the, throughout the Puget Sound region, but we still don't have a good understanding of whether it's more prominent in urban environments than say natural environments or whether there's some places you go and there it doesn't it isn't there, and then other places you go and it, it's very obvious that it's there, and so we're still really um, early in our understanding of this, but it does seem like it is a factor affecting uh, many maples, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, and we kind of anticipate it's going to get worse as the region continues to to warm and get drier as. Um, as we really experience the effects of climate change. So city bark disease is caused by this fungus called Cryptostroma corticale, but it's actually been reclassified in this um, Biscognoxia um, neoxia, Biscognoxia. It's a, it's a group, um, it's a genus of fungi. Um, they're ascomycetes. They, they um, produce these little conidia spores that are very easily um, spread from tree to tree in the wind and things like that. But they're closely related to some other cool fungi um, that have never really been thought of as a concern. Um, they're just kind of wood decay or they're, they're saprophytes or they, they affect, um, they're not readily killing trees. So for example, hypoxin is uh, another fungus closely related to this, this fungus, it turns out. This is the list of um, trees that were confirmed, where um, samples were sent to Bartlett Diagnostic Lab and they confirmed that the fungus was on those samples. So um, at this time we can't, you know, we don't really know, um, did that fungus just land on the tree or did it actually kill the tree or is it contributing to the health of that tree? We assume it is affecting the tree, but we haven't, actually investigated that. So far, we're just confirming all the different trees where we find um, cryptostroma, but we are starting to get a better understanding of um, what it looks like and and becoming more confident in, in being able to determine is that it or not. Um, in a lot of cases, I think now we can almost just look at photos and have a pretty good, um, a good with some confidence, you know, be able to say yes or no, that's sooty bark disease, but really to be, to be um, really confident, we'd like to actually confirm it with molecular techniques and, and um, by sequencing the DNA or trying to uh, amplify certain parts of the DNA that we know the fungus has. Um, so since those samples have been submitted to Barlett and since our lab in Pialp got involved, we've, um, we've received a number of samples and we've confirmed the presence of this fungus on some of those samples. Um, for example, field maple, I mean, take these with a grain of salt because this is a sample size of one. Um, you know, only one sample was submitted, but we confirmed it was positive. Uh, field maple and vine maple, um, we've also confirmed it on this fern leaf full moon maple, which is probably uh, ornamental. Um, Notably, we find it very often on our big leaf maple now, or maybe I shouldn't say we find it often. We, we've consistently isolated it from samples collected from big leaf maple um, pretty, free, pretty consistently. Um, and these samples have come from Seattle, Tacoma, Anacortes, and Bellingham, and now also Olympia. 
And so it does seem like big leaf maple is being impacted by this fungus. This is some, some photos. I just have a bunch of photos to share now about the disease, about the symptoms that we're seeing or actually the signs of the fungus. Um, the signs of the fungus is this, this sooty kind of um, spore layer that's produced on the outer edge of uh, like the cambial tissues, but underneath of the bark. And so the characteristic here is that the bark has flecked off. It's just kind of pop, popped off or fallen off. And underneath is this black sooty mold, if you will. It's like a mold. It kind of looks like a mold. Um, and so that's really the diagnostic features that we look for in photos is like, has the bark popped off or flaked off? And is there this black underneath? If you see black on the outside of the bark, that's, that's something different. You don't need to be concerned as far as we're aware. Um, but if you see it, the bark has flaked off, then, then that's a good indication that this fungus is present. Um, but sometimes the tree, you know, the tree will look completely healthy from the outside. Um, and then a, upon closer investigation, you might just notice one whole limb has died um, and you'll start to see these symptoms. We tend to see the sooty when, on, you know, when the tree is in pretty bad shape or when that stem is in pretty bad shape. Um, when, the, when the stem looks pretty healthy, you don't tend to see this. And I'll explain our understanding of why that is in a minute. Other times you might see, um, you know, pretty clear sign that the tree is dying back. And, and so in this case, it's a big leaf maple um, in very close area to this other tree is just a little bit over here on the left of this top photo. But um, very clearly has crown dieback. It, it should have leaves on all these branches, but it doesn't. And so that's um, and in, in a, kind of an indicator that something's going on. And in this case, we're asking folks like you to, to go and take a closer look and see if you see symptoms like this in this case. Now, I recognize that this mid-November right now, um, so these trees don't have these leaves anymore. So this is really just something to think about for next summer um, and, and follow up with us about the, the latest that we're learning about this disease. But Together, when we start to see this, we can investigate it closer. However, that said, you might still find trees um, where you'll find the symptoms or the signs of this fungus, um, even though the tree is, has dropped all its leaves. But certainly when the tree has its leaves and you see this dieback in the crown, um, you know it's pretty striking and, and clear that there's something going on with that tree. So it makes it easier to pick out which trees might be infected or not. But I think when you start to see this is, is pretty far along in the disease development. And so um, at this point, you know, the, the fungus has kind of um, taken its toll on this stem, for example, but these other stem haven't, it hasn't quite grown into them yet. This is some example, these are um, water birch trees that we confirmed are positive. So you might recognize this park. Um, so far, I've shown you some, some photos from, um, pardon me. Some, so far, I've shown you photos from Franklin Park in Tacoma, and now this is Ferry Park. Um, and it's just a, it's sad to see this disease emerging and these trees in, in poor shape, um, partly this fungus, if not um, more so, but factors that are affecting the health of trees, like these droughts. And um, this very park, apparently, there was some gap in the irrigation. And, and um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to, to add stress to these trees and then kind of help this fungus do its, do its dirty work, if you will. Um, so this is what it looked like on, on um, this water birch, again, the bark is flaking off, but it did look a little bit different. You didn't see that black sooty. And this just really illustrates that um, it might look different on different species. We, we don't have a good understanding of how it looks on all the different trees. But on big leaf maple, it's pretty consistent. We'll see this black um, sooty 
patches underneath the bark that's flaked off. And sometimes it will turn kind of gray. And I think that's kind of what happens after it's, it's released all its spores. Um, this is a picture of a vine maple. Um, we, we haven't confirmed that this is, this is the sooty bark. We're, we're working on that. Um, but I collected a sample from this vine maple, and this is in Clark's Creek in Puyallup. Again, this is a red maple. Um, so we're seeing, we've are seen it, I've shown you photos so far on red maple and big leaf maple. Um, again, we just see this crown dieback and then a little bit closer investigation. And this is what I saw on the stem of that red maple. Um, and then this is kind of what it looks like on the big leaf maple, it's a little bit different. Um, again, this is big leaf maple. Um, sometimes the, the canopy will be quite healthy, but you'll see these symptoms on it, in these signs. These are more recent. This is on runway. Um, this is a, a, a sycamore maple. Um, and so you can see this is what it looks like when it's wet. Again, the bark has flaked off and then it's really black um, mold layer. It's, it's kind of more um, texturized than mold, for example. It's a little bit, um, it's not squishy or anything. It's kind of hot. Um, but yeah, that's just an example of, of how the spores are very easily spread. Um, they have these giant patches and basically all of this black is, is a bunch of different um, mycelium and, and also like conidia and, and spore bearing structures that release these spores um, in the wind. Um, I think this middle one is also sycamore maple, so you can see it looks a little bit different than on the big leaf maple, but we still don't have a great understanding of how it looks on all these different trees. Um, this is just demonstrating that sometimes you might see these kind of patches or these, I like to refer to them as bleeds. They kind of look like there's bleeding going on underneath of the bark. And so you might see this before the tree has actually shed the bark. And then once it does shed the bark, like it had here, you'll see that black kind of sooty um, texture underneath of the bark. Um, this, I'm not entirely sure. This seemed like it was on the outside of the bark, but again, this is like something that I would be I'm interested to, to sample and, and confirm. And so if you ever want to send a sample like this or, or know um, if it's there, then, then you can contact me or send us something. I'll get to that. And we also have seen it on you know, limbs that fall off of trees. And we don't, there is some, some suggestion that it stops sporulating once the tree is dead um, or once the tissues are not, no longer alive. So um, it's unclear whether these limbs that can fall off trees are, are um, you know, still helping spread the fungus or what their role is or how it works at that point. This is our, um, as far as we understand kind of the, the life cycle of this pathogen or this fungus inside um, affecting these trees is that it spreads through these, the xylem tissues of that, the wood inside of the tree um, and so it will maybe in fact a branch that is broken and then slowly grow down in the tree. And it, as it grows outward, um, once it reaches this cambial tissue, that's when you start to see the bark flake off. And that's when you start to see that sooty structure on the outside. But what we think is happening is that a lot of our trees are actually infected. We just haven't, it hasn't grown to the edge in a space where you're likely to see it. Um, until it's in pretty bad shape. So we would love to do more research and we, we would like to do more research just investigating how many of our trees have this kind of stain um, and how many of these stains are caused by the same fungus. There's a lot of stain or, or vascular wilt type of, of fungi um, that basically um, the tree either shuts down those cells or compartmentalizes them. So the fungus can't spread, or the spread the fungus might actually produce structures that clog up those pores. And so these xylem cells in trees and wood are really just like really long straws or mini straws connected together 
that help water um, go from the roots to the canopy um, through like capillary action and, and some of the other um, methods. But you can just think of it as clogging up those draws and, and, and causing the tree to wilt in some cases. But then this pathogen is kind of confusing because it also starts to cause these little cankers and it seems to be um, maybe living or killing this cambial tissues, which aren't um, primarily transferring water. They're more, more um, of where you see the sugar transfer from photosynthates to back down to the roots and things like that. So that's a brief intro to this disease. It's kind of a crazy disease, but um, the thing that's really interesting or the, the thing that is baffling to me is that we just don't know very much about it. There's, um, there's a lot of research being done in Germany, but this is like a, a pretty new issue to us. Um, we didn't, you know, we, it wasn't really on our radar. There's been a lot of research in, in the dieback of big leaf maple and some research recently has linked that to longer and hotter droughts, but it also seems like this disease has been kind of accumulating and growing and um, um, brewing in our urban forest for, for a long time. And it's just now starting to have a real you know, impact. But understanding that impact we do, is very limited. We don't understand how, you know, how spread, how far spread is this? What communities are affected? Is it in every city or is it only in the, you know, the five cities where we found it so far? Um, should we be trying to limit the spread or is it everywhere? And also what trees are susceptible? Um, seems like, uh, you know, we just kind of have to like think, you know, if you see an unhealthy tree or if you see a stain, um, it's really good just to, to confirm whether or not it's affected by this fungus because we're still trying to learn which trees are susceptible and we, we don't have a full list of all the species in the, the area that might be in, vulnerable to this. So that's where you can help as community scientists in this, in this Forest Health Watch program. And I'm gonna just talk about that a little bit. Um, we use a tool called iNaturalist and we have a lot of different projects on there. But our primary focus has been Western red cedar. And so um, I encourage you to get involved in, in any of these projects. But today I'm going to talk about the sooty bark disease project first. Um, again, these are all different projects on iNaturalist. We love iNaturalist. It's a, it's a really nice tool. It's completely um, open. So the data that's collected and shared on there um, is available to other scientists. And who knows who's going to want to use this in the future. But we are like the first people to really start tracking tree health issues with this tool. And so it's a really fun um, experience for us. But we love iNaturalist because it's open. It's free. There's no ads. Um, you can create a lot of different projects and use kind of the same information. And once you get good at one project, then you can pretty much join or create your own projects and, and go as you will. We like iNaturalist because there's a huge community already using it. More than 400 million, or excuse me, more than almost 4 million people have, have gotten involved, but together they've submitted um, more than 65 million. I think this is quite outdated, um, but more than 65 observations, 65 million observations. So that's um, an observation it could be a single photo or it could be a bunch of different photos of the same organism but um, there's a lot of observations of the natural world and the organisms that are in the world. And so we also love it because of the ability to create these projects. And so there's a lot of different ways to get involved. Um, we essentially have been talking about tree health issues and we hear about tree health issues for a long time, but um, we hadn't really started tracking where that's happening until now. And so I welcome you to get involved and help us understand how big are these issues and um, what, you know, what can we learn from it? Generally, um, the way iNaturalist works is you take a picture of any organism and you share it online and the community helps you identify it. And they also can link it into research projects like we do. Um, in some cases you might find an, an organism that 
that people um, are really interested in knowing about. Like maybe you'll find an endangered salamander or something um, cool like that. And in this case, Fish and Wildlife, Washington State Fish and Wildlife might follow up with you and be like, wow, did you really see that endangered salamander in the Olympics? And, and that is, I think, a story that it might be, maybe the salamander wasn't endangered, but um, I can't remember the specifics, but that's a story that did happen in Washington um, with the salamander in the Olympics. And, and just sharing a picture on iNaturalist um, started a, a much bigger a monitoring campaign for this really important rare salamander that somebody found. So we added a project on um, iNaturalist to start sharing pictures of where we see this. And I would really appreciate it if, if you all um, are willing to engage with us at the, in this. If you see an unhealthy tree and you see that it has this sooty symptoms, you know, please take a few pictures and add it to uh, the iNaturalist project. Um, generally how that works is you'll take a picture of a, of a maple, um, you'll add it on, um, you'll identify that it's a big leaf maple or you'll, you'll, you'll suggest that it's big leaf maple, the community will help you. Uh, then you tag this project. Sorry, these are kind of out of order. But, so at the bottom of this observation, before you click share, it'll say projects and that's where you can say, I want to add this to the Sooty Bark Disease Watch project. And then there's a couple other questions like, do you plan to submit a sample? Or, or if you have submitted a sample, you know, has it been confirmed as the same thing? Those kind of questions. Um, and then you click share and, and, and then it gets added to this project. And when you get a better understanding of where it's, where it's occurring um, and, and what trees it's affecting. If you're willing to go the extra mile, we also welcome um, samples. So, um, you know, folks like City of Seattle's Parks and Recreation have been sending us samples. Um, Anacorta City, I think also Parks and Rec sent us some samples recently. Um, we really welcome you to, to collect and sample uh, and send a sample to our lab. And we don't need a huge sample. Usually you can just chip off some pieces of bark around the black sooty spores and that should be enough for us to confirm with um, DNA and, and um, molecular techniques to confirm it's the same fungus. With that said though it's important to to note that there is some concern around the, the these spores and your health. Um, the, this fungus and, and these spores has been known to cause respiratory issues in mill workers who um, you know, work very closely and um, with a lot of material. And in some cases, if they're processing a lot of moldy or sooty bark disease infected maple, um, there's been demonstrated cases of having these respiratory or these um, kind of pneumonia-like um, issues. Um, it's not an infective fungus, as far as we can tell. It's not going to infect you. It just is like the spores have, um, you know, toxins in them that you don't want to breathe in. However, with that said, um, it's we're working with the the um, public health in King County and the uh, um, NL and I, the labor and industries guys, uh, L and I, to come up with some some uh, FAQs and some documents, but through working with them, it seems like um, in most cases, it's really low risk that you'll be impacted by these spores. Only you have to be working with the material and readily breathing in these spores um, um, over time and, and frequently um, to really have it, to be at risk. And I'm happy to talk about that more, but I'm not a public health expert and don't want to give you the wrong information, but just want you to be aware that there is some um, links to these spores as um, you know not being great to breathe in. So take caution if you're going to um, collect samples, and feel free to email me with questions around that. Um, but yeah, so ultimately, what we're after and what we'd love your help um, to do is to really get a better understanding of the distribution of um, this disease, how, how 
widespread? Is it is it only in the natural or excuse me, is it only in the urban environments? Or are we also seeing it out in our natural forests? Um, you know, is it not in some communities, but in more communities like Tacoma, where we found it, in Tacoma and Seattle? But does that mean it's also um, in neighboring communities or not? We don't really know. Um, knowing that kind of information will be really helpful for understanding, you know, how should we try and reduce the spread of this organism? Or is that futile because it's everywhere? Um, we also don't have a good understanding of the trees that are susceptible and which trees may be affected. And so if you see an unhealthy tree, um, you know, you might look for this and you might collect a sample and send it to us just so we can see if that's if this is a factor that might be affecting these trees. So really, our hope is to, to better understand the extent of this fungus and, and with that, we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how it's impacting our, our, our forests and communities. But we really also want to understand which trees are vulnerable and which trees um, should we plant in the future and which trees you know, might be extra susceptible uh, or extra vulnerable in areas that we know this disease exists. And so um, together, we can really advance knowledge. I wish we had more knowledge about this organism, but um, it's pretty urgent that we, we try and find more support for research to do more research around this organism, but also um, that we engage with you all to get more information and, and really advance uh, learning and, and, um, and knowledge about this organism. So I really appreciate this opportunity to share um, about our, our our research program. Thank you to the Tacoma Tree Foundation. Um, it's been a, a, a great honor to interact with you all and I hope to continue this relationship. And, and um, I, I always say I'm trying to put my roots down really deep in Tacoma. So I welcome you all to reach out to me and, and, um, and let's connect. And so um, with that, with that I, I welcome you Luna and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really cool presentation. I knew nothing about this disease and I feel like I learned a whole lot. So thank you so much. Um, anybody who's watching, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them. If not, I also have a couple questions. So okay. um, this, one, this one isn't from me actually, but I like it. Um, so we know that trees communicate and send resources through fungi in their root systems. How do you tell a good fungus from a harmful one in a tree? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think for us, you know, one way to approach that would be to sample healthy trees and then sample mm. unhealthy trees and compare and see is there different communities with these unhealthy trees? Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of point, pinpoint which fungi or, or which microbes are associated with unhealthy. And then from there, you have to take it a little further and, and actually maybe infect a couple of trees with those fungi just to mm -hmm. see what happens and, and can really confirm that those fungi are bad for that tree. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it takes a couple of steps to really be sure uh, when a fungus is bad. In the case of sooty bark disease, it seems like it's, it was, it, it's been recognized as an endophyte which means that it um, kind of can live in a host and not cause any issue. It's not, oh, it's not good for the tree, but it wasn't really affecting the tree. But then as the environment changes, it kind of emerges more as a pathogen rather than just oh. this end fight. And so we're kind of seeing that shift happen. Um, and that's, I think it's an example that uh, you know, a fungus might be an endophyte today, but as the environment changes or you introduce a new tree species or something, then it can become a pathogen. It just yeah. is kind of fluid and does its best to survive. Um, a good parasite doesn't kill its host because mm -hmm. then it kills itself, but, mm -hmm. um, but they've kind of co-evolved together these resistances and these, um, you know, ways to Ex, um, exploit those their weaknesses but um, 
you know, as soon as you introduce a new host that hasn't co-evolved with that organism, then it doesn't have any resistances to it or vice versa. Um, you know, you introduce a new fungus to um, a different environment and that might trigger it to, to behave differently. Yeah. Interesting. Good question. Um, yeah. We'd love to do more research about the beneficial fungi too. Um, mm. Yes. They're great. They're, great they're, they're, yeah, they're pretty fun. They're lovely. Um, <laughs> okay. Dang, that's so interesting though. So it can be, it doesn't actually have to be bad, but it just can do it. So with climate change and um, just new, new things being introduced, what, like, what are the main things you think that are triggering that to happen? Yeah, it seems like this fungus um, does have kind of maybe a higher optimal growth temperature than other fungi. So mm. it, it likes warmer weather, warmer temperatures, mm -hmm. but that in itself um, is aiding the fungus. I'm not entirely sure about that. That's kind of a hypothesis. Okay. But, um, yes. but in addition, when a tr tree becomes stressed from mm -hmm. say water stress, it cannot defend itself as well. And oh. so in the past, you know, maybe you would see a branch break and then the tree would produce enough sap or mm -hmm. um, you know, some other fluids that it's excreting through its open cells, essentially for the broken branch that it can seal itself. But if it becomes mm -hmm. water stressed, it might not be able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. so together, that is also making them more vulnerable to the, thing, the effects of insects and fungi and other organisms that it might have tolerated in the past. That makes sense. Good question. Okay. Um, well, you have pulled up here. Yeah, this is really good. I saw there's a question kind of, um, there was a question that says, do Washington, Western Washington cities have a lot of trees that seem to be at risk to city bark disease? How serious could this be? Um, I, how serious could be could this be is tricky. We don't really know much, enough about it. And I feel like we're in a good spot because we're at the front, you know, we're, we're studying this before we start to see a lot of trees affected. Um, it seems like, you know, it, it's popping up. Um, I kind of suspect it's going to get worse and worse as things continue to warm and dry out, but that's uh, our hypothesis. Um, so it's hard to say how serious this is, but I do think it's it's um, it's an issue. And one thing I would like to to investigate, you know, is bringing this this um, element of equity in which neighborhoods are going to be the most affected, um, which ones are the most vulnerable. If it's really driven by heat, then we would expect uh, neighborhoods that are hotter to be more vulnerable to you know this fungus affecting their trees. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity to explore that. What does that mean? How can we better support these communities? Um, how do we predispose those communities to, to this, the effects of this? Um, right here, I'm showing you Tree Plotter, um, which is this open data set from Tacoma. You can explore all our trees. Um, I just wanted to point out like here, these neighborhoods near Swan Creek um, have been planted with pretty much streets of the same species. And oh. so this, this is something this, the city has already corrected and they no longer do this as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Essentially says if there's something that's gonna kill this tree, that community is gonna be really affected because there's mm -hmm. only one tree. Um, and in this case, it is a Norway maple, yep. which we have confirmed is, we found Cryptostroma corticale on Norway maple but we don't have a good understanding of it. Does it kill the tree? Does it do it quickly? You know, what does it take for the tree to really be susceptible to this? Mm. But this is just an example of, um, you know, the practices we're moving away from and Tacoma has been really good about it because of issues like this. Yes. We don't want these communities. So in the future, um, cities are doing a much better job planting diversity and case, you know, so that um, if that tree down the street is affected, you know, it's a different tree in front of your house. And so it's not gonna be affected by the same thing. Um, and so the, 
that's one way that we're trying to increase resilience in our urban forests and, and avoid the impacts of fungi like this. Mm -hmm. That's but a yeah. really map to look at. Yeah. yeah, that's why I brought it up. It's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's also another example that um, the city would really love more engagement from folks like us to help get a better data set around what trees are in these communities. Um, you know, it's pretty limited. It takes a lot of time and effort to document all these trees. Some cities have had more success and more resources but it's really a great opportunity for us to use a tool um, like iNaturalist and start recording what, what trees are in our community. So then we can look at tools like this and pick out which communities might be vulnerable to, uh, to climate change or to disease. And I would love to partner or welcome, you know, I would welcome it, work, work with anyone on these kind of ideas. Um, I'm here and I think there's a lot of great opportunity to, to share these stories and really amplify um, the issue and the concern, the concern around the issue and, and really start having meaningful conversations about how, what needs to be done and how can we think, you know, how can we learn from what has happened in the past to, to increase resilience for the future. And I would love to work with more folks on that. Absolutely. Dang, okay. Well, thank you so much. I hope this is a this is a great thing to know about. Um, I have one last question. First, is if <laughs> I guess in the past, if you've seen stuff that's similar to this, have you guys had a way of addressing this that you were hopeful about or um, you're looking to go to, or is it more like we don't even know what we don't know yet about this, so we can't say? <laughs> yeah. Um... That's such a good question, and and I think it's it's really just demonstrates that we need more research urgently mm -hmm. on the health of our trees. And mm -hmm. um, right now, the the best thing that we can do is work together to understand um, mm -hmm. what's going on, and then from there we can start figuring out what's what's the next steps. How do we how do we solve this? What works to um, keep these trees healthy? Mm -hmm. But at this time. It's kind of a groom, gloomy story because I don't have you yeah. know, a good solution to it. It's more That's, just we're not in that we're not in that phase yeah. yet. That's all we're just well, yeah. yeah. We'd like to get there though, um, and and with community science and more engagement, I think um, the more people involved, the 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 faster we can learn together and and advance knowledge about um, the next steps to find solutions. So okay. that's kind of the takeaway. Um, you know, the good news is that we can work together to, to, to figure this out and um, and help our Tacoma community in the future. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's a really great place to go to. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming and talking about this um, and for offering your hand into some of the support if anyone wants to get involved. Um, I think that's a really, really nice thing to do. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody. Um, this will be up on YouTube and yeah, thank you Tacoma Creates for funding this. I'm really happy we got to bring you in. And yeah. Yeah. My, yeah, the honor is mine. Thank you so much. And, and I, I look forward to engaging more with the, the Tree Foundation and, and mm -hmm. thank you Tacoma Creates. Yay. All right, well have a good night day everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you Luna. Bye.